There we go. Cool. So welcome, everybody. I think we should be live now. Yeah, cool. Got a notification for it and everything. Cool. So hello, everybody. Welcome to Look Good, Feel Better. I'm William, and I'm with Edward. You want to say hello, Edward? Hello, folks. And today we're going to be talking about basically how to look good and feel better. Wow. Surprise, surprise. So we're going to basically try and dissect what a great life looks like and how feeling good in your body is accomplished. We're going to take all of those aspects and figure out how we can actually achieve them. And we're going to be going beneath the surface today. We're really going to be taking a look at the, the deeper contributing factors that are actually influencing us and our lives so that we can really have the best lives possible. So I think the, the place I want to go here, first of all, is to just ask Edward. Edward, what do you think the phrase look good means? What does that mean to you? Um, well, of course, look good is such a subjective thing. Yeah. I think what look good means is be happy or feel comfortable with the presence that you bring to the world around mm -hmm. you. Um, okay. And so, yeah. The, it's the quite depth to that. There's a lot of depth to that. Yeah, there absolutely yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and, and what do you think that, about the, the superficial element of that? Um, I think we're all human. And so I think yeah. we see um, that it only matters what's on the inside, but I think the reality is, and there's lots of factors, but, you know, we're conditioned. We're told, though, you know, it matters what's on the inside, but then look, go past a rack of magazines or watch anything on TV. And, you know, we, we are conditioned constantly to um, judge by appearances. Mm -hmm. And so... so do, you think but, that's, yeah. do you think that's purely conditioning or do you think there is some level of natural innate instinct to that? I think, yeah, I think um, biology comes into it quite a lot. Yeah. I think um, kind of, uh, yeah, our, our kind of biological imperative to procreate um, will play its part. Yeah, you know? I um, think so too. <laughs> we are human, right? <laughs> yeah, we are, we are. And so, yeah, we want to, it's not just that we want to look like the supermodel on the magazine or anything. Mm -hmm. We want to feel good about ourselves. And to some extent, I think that what mm -hmm. is, on the outside does reflect what's on the inside. Um, yeah. I think that can be seen in mm -hmm. how tidy our house is or how, you know, organized or disorganized we are mm -hmm. in life in general. Um, quite often when we let our mind unravel into chaos, that can be seen in our appearance. I think yeah. it can. I absolutely agree with you that. I think it's spot on. Um, and yeah, healthy body, healthy mind. Um, yeah. It's true. Um, and I think, the word holistic gets bandied around quite a lot. Um, and I don't I think we lose the actual meaning of holistic. Like it yeah. means whole. And I think that um we've got a lot of compartmentalized different therapies mm -hmm. all trying to do their own thing to help people. And I think that whatever one we focus on, things end up falling through the gaps. And I think yeah. that okay. um, both of us are on the same page when it comes yeah, to I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> so I what I what I really like here is so if we look at holistic. Using that word, do you think it's important that we actually try and integrate that we do have some superficiality about us? That's actually a, not just a, a valid, but also a valuable part of us, of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so whether we want to look at it as good or bad, um, I mean, young and shadow work and all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. um, the persona. Uh, if part of our true self is that we are slightly superficial and that we like pretty things, if that is really part of us, then us working really hard to pretend that that isn't part of us doesn't make us happier or healthier. Yeah. It hurts, so, right? It actually makes yeah. you sick. Yeah, it does. It's really bad for you. And I think, um, not to get too much into psychology, but Jung talked about the, the authentic self and the mask that we make for the world's consumption. Mm -hmm. And the further that they are apart from each other, the the less sane you are and less yeah. mm -hmm. you are in life. And so if you are superficial a little bit, if you do care about looks a little bit, then that is real and that is within you, whether yeah. or not you tell the world that it's not. Cool. I like that. I think I don't think you'll hear that everywhere. I think some people will say it doesn't matter at all. And that's also not the truth. Like you've got one extreme is just as wrong as the other extreme. The truth is usually somewhere in the middle, but that's a bit more boring. So people aren't so interested in that. They want this polarity on the end where you've got conflict. It's actually kind of in the middle. So it's important. It's not everything, but it is important. There's value yeah. that. Absolutely. So do you think that 
I think kind of the way we set this up, like look good, feel bad, we kind of split them, but they're also kind of, they're very close. Would you say that you think that, and tell me if you don't, I'm kind of, it's a bit of a leading question, maybe I'm projecting a bit, because this is what I believe to be true. Tell me if you agree or, or not. I believe that people generally tend to look good when they actually feel good inside because they're taking care of themselves. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, it's so complicated, but um, have you read The Twits by Roald Dahl? I haven't. Right. Maybe yeah. I have when I was little, but I don't remember it. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a small paragraph towards the beginning of the book, and it says, if you have an inner light shining out of you, it doesn't matter if you've got wonky teeth or a crooked nose, you will be essentially attractive to people because of the light that is shining out mm. of you. And conversely, you could be aesthetically perfect, but if there is ugliness inside you that will also be that will also shine out of you mm -hmm. and it will make you ugly and so i think that the concept of beauty and ugly yeah it lies in the aesthetic definitely but it definitely lies within the emotional or psychological state of the individual absolutely 100 cool. percent. and so they they work together and they also work together negatively if that makes sense mm -hmm. Cool. I, I like that that's nice and i like the, the book maybe i'll give it a read <laughs> <laughs> certainly should so I think that we should also maybe look at maybe there's a bit of a charge on the on the on the end of the name of this. Feel better. You don't all feel good all the time. And that is also a part of life. Yeah. And I think like social media and magazines and the internet. I was just saying on a little snippet earlier. I took I, I got married, I took a bunch of photos, I put one on Facebook. Like that one, it one everybody sees that one picture and they think like magical day. Wow, it must have been amazing. There's probably a bunch of pictures where I've got like a double chin like sticking out like this, <laughs> and maybe I'm uh, and maybe I've got like a wrinkle in my shirt, or maybe there's a stain somewhere. It's not perfect, but we kind of get stuck with these perfectionist standards because we think that's what everybody else is doing. Yeah. But it's, it's not funny. even close to the truth. That's right. Yeah. And I think when we get into discussions with people, everyone knows it. When we discuss that people yeah. obviously choose the best picture of their evening yeah. meal or of course you whatever will. it is. Of it's course you will. Yeah. But that's the persona. That's the, the mask that we want the world to perceive of us rather than our real selves. And so I think part of um, happiness and therefore feeling better is acceptance of your flaws and being, yeah, honest and reflective with yourself and maybe with the world as well and allowing your imperfection to um, be part of you and be seen essentially and accept that of yourself. I think that's really, really important. So I like that, accept your flaws. I like it. Sounds like a nice concept. How? What does it look like? How do you do that? Um, I would help people <laughs> when I, in the therapy room, I help people to to realize that their measure of what is good, what is bad, what is um, worthwhile, what is honorable, um, can be seen in certain things that they value in their life and not value in their life. And mm -hmm. if they are wanting in certain areas, put actionable things in place to work towards bettering mm. themselves in some way. It's not so it's tangible. Them, that is. So it's tangible, measurable, and actionable. Mm -hmm. And I think that also self-value and self-worth comes from us taking on the challenge and doing and embarking on the journey of trying to get better. Mm -hmm. I don't think you don't wait until the journey's ended at the end of your life and say, well, I finally managed to overcome that thing and I'm, I can on my dying day be happy with my lot. It's more like when you embark on the journey, that's where satisfaction comes from. That's where self-worth comes from. Um, and then you start to build an authentic self that you can be proud of. And then that's where boundaries come from because you start be, because you're working hard on something that you know is for mm -hmm. the greater good or for at least your betterment, there's something to defend and that's where the beginning of healthy boundaries start getting built where it's like actually I'm working towards something worthwhile and I owe it to myself not to allow someone to detract me from that mm -hmm. so where does someone start doing that um honest reflection at what's going wrong okay and that's quite hard when you can't see your own shadow I guess Yes. Uh, well, yeah, it's really hard to be honest with yourself. We kid ourselves yeah. all the time. So you're, you're basically saying in, in, a, in a kind of roundabout way, you need somebody's help. You can't really see where you're going wrong yourself. 
yeah, often we have a blind spot to our own vulnerabilities. Yeah. yeah. And we sometimes feel the effect of them. So we might feel yeah. thumps or be anxious or things like that, but we often can't see the root cause. And often with a little bit of guidance or at least a sounding board that can hint one way or the other, quite easily mm -hmm. the penny drops mm -hmm. and you're like, of course, of course it's that. And of course I, that's where it comes from. And I love those words you use, root cause. That's such a big thing in my line of work. Yeah. Root cause is all about root cause, you know? And the analogy that I use here, if you're trying to understand what root cause actually means is, imagine your, 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 your sink is broken, tap, the faucet won't stop running. Eventually it's gonna start spilling out all over the sink. You're gonna have water all over the floor. And you can go and chase that and you can go and mop it all up. But as soon as you finish mopping it, it's still flowing out. The tap is still running. The root cause is go back, fix the tap, or just maybe you've just left it on. You know, sometimes it's not even like the tap's destroyed. It's just like you turn the tap off. And then the sink is there. Things normally seem to sort themselves out quite, quite rapidly when you turn that root cause off because there's kind of built-in mechanisms. Yeah. So how does someone go about identifying the root cause of where they're stuck? Um. Well, when I work with people, when we what we tend to do is what I call mapping. So mapping. people come to me and say, this thing is wrong. And I say, okay, and so I, we chat for a bit and it's really talking about the present. What has become so dysfunctional that we are sitting together having a conversation? Mm -hmm. And so that would be dealing with the present and then the, the conversation inevitably ends up trickling back into the past that this has kind of happened because it's come from here Oh, and that blah blah blah, and it and it just and I'm, we're mapping out where we were and how we've ended up here, and that's generally that is where as long if you add it to and where would you like to be, well mm. if you know where you've been and you know where you are and you know where you'd like to be, it's not a difficult process to work out what are the small things or the big things okay. that need to change okay. to get from here to there. So what you're what you're kind of inferring with that is that most people that are kind of stuck in a problematic state, not only do they not know where they are, they also don't know where they want to go. Often, often. And and so I, I actually, in, in some of my therapy sessions, I almost make it farcical. If you had a magic wand and we'll take lottery wins. I say that too. It, you know, dream, dream. What would life, if it was amazing and euphoric and you woke up every morning with a smile on your face, what would it look like? What would it, What would you be like? And what are you like right now? So what would have to change in you, the you right now, to be that new you? And generally the answer is let go of the past, generally speaking. Sounds easy. I what was it? Easy. Let go of the past. Just five words. Got to be easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'll do. And yeah, it's both incredibly complicated, incredibly difficult, and incredibly simple at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Simple doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah, yeah I, I take exactly the same philosophy when it comes to health, healing, symptoms. What's the root cause? Usually has a very simple solution. Doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. That's actually how I describe the men that I support with weight loss. Simple, but not easy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. so, so they come to me and they say, meat, and they go, yep. And they go, veg, and they go, yep. And then they go off and they do it. There's sometimes they go off the rails and they go drinking for two weeks, yeah. like weeks in a row, and loads of complex stuff. But really, they're quite simplistic in their approach. Yeah. So I kind of, I, it's a joke, but like you know. Do you do you find that it really for most for most people is it they need to know more about food, they need to know more about their diet, they need to cut the calories, or is it some there's um, something else? It's it's no it's I. I don't know, I, I quit. I don't know if it's a joke. It's not meant to be funny, but I talk about the psychological approach to weight loss. That's yeah. what I do. And really, everything that you would learn from me about nutrition, you could Google in 30 seconds. Yeah, it's all bad. So carbs and all sugar bad. are bad for you, whether it's a microbiologist telling you or me. That, that is the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, eating at night isn't very good for you. Most medical professionals in the world would tell you that. Most people that... I've done a lot of diets will tell you that. Most people will tell you that. The hard bit of, for in my case and what I do with people, the hard bit of losing weight is sticking at it. Mm -hmm. And so you might call me an attitude coach. You might call me a positivity coach. You might call me a managing life coach. But really, because if you can manage life, manage stress, sleep better, have 
you know, more healthy interpersonal relationships, feel motivated, feel enthusiastic, get excited about learning on this new journey. Well, whether it's learning French, learning to drive, or following an eating routine, any of them are easier if all those things have fallen into place in the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you're saying why is a symptom? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's never a root cause, it's a symptom. That's right. Okay, and I'd just be interested in your in your in your expertise. Where would you say this this ratio splits? Is it like most people tend to have a physical root cause? Most people tend to have a more emotional or a thought pattern root cause. Is it normally a bit of a mix? Where do you find people are? Where do people lie? Where where are people stuck? Um, it would depend on what you define as um, physical. But okay, okay, uh, <laughs> um, ninety percent emotional. Okay, so that's heavy. Yeah. So that's the that's that's what we really mean. It's like it's the deeper stuff. It's the deeper layers. Yes, as 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 well. You know, um, and yeah, root cause is what we're talking about. Yeah. Something is not firing or working correctly in the mind, and often that has been knocked out of place by something that you've been mm -hmm. through, or lots of things that you've been through, and so the program isn't working quite correctly in the mind. And therefore, the output isn't correct. And in this case, we're talking about food. So just to give a little tiny example, um, we know that food isn't happiness. It isn't love. It isn't God. It isn't comfort. It is just food. But when we're young and we're learning how to interpret the world and how to respond yes. to things you know, organically and stuff, little boy falls over and skins his knee. Mum picks him up. He is crying. Mum gets ice cream, hands ice cream. Boy feels good. He feels okay, stops crying. 30 years later, boy is sitting at home being dumped by his girlfriend or lost his job. And of course, he's going to reach for it because ice cream equals happiness and comfort. Mm -hmm. And so the lesson that was learned has shaped the brain to interpret the world as when I feel sad, sugar makes it better. Mm. And this happens in a million ways with a million outputs, anxiety and depression and alcoholism and insomnia and bedwetting and Every dysfunction, everything mm -hmm. that logically we wouldn't do if we chose how to behave, but we don't because it comes from somewhere deeper within us, the unconscious mind, because that's what drives human behavior. Because there is stuff going on back there and it's driving the behavior, it doesn't matter that logically we would know ice cream doesn't fix a broken heart, just mm -hmm. like tapping yourself on the head doesn't fix an itchy knee. You're trying to provide, it's the wrong solution yeah. to the problem that you have. But because the connection was made at an earlier time, mm -hmm. you get the response. So would you say that that kind of, I guess it's a coping mechanism. Yes. Cut your knee, have ice cream, coping with the pain. What's what's like a healthy way to do this? Um, well, <laughs> come for hypnotherapy. Um, there, there are lots of ways to um, correct incorrect thinking patterns and there are meditations and there's nlp and there's you know um if the starting point is recognizing what you're doing and that's the hard awareness part. awareness absolutely awareness and this is an honesty and awareness and just to jump into sort of the weight loss thing again the first point is oh no i got fat or bigger than i would like to be and this is how much i weigh and these clothes don't fit me and just you don't have to shout it to the world but at least be honest with yourself mm -hmm. and say, this is where I am right now. And as the, you know, in the analogy or the explanation I was given about my therapy sessions, this is where I am right now. By all means, have a look at where, where that journey, how that journey has happened to get to the right now. But where do I want to be? Thinner, happier. So what needs to change in me? Well, better sleep, better stress management, more a better diet, getting more nutrition from your food. These are the things that will get me to that happy person that I want to be in the future. And as as getting bigger is a symptom of sort of dysfunction and unhappiness, being slimmer or healthier or stronger or whatever it is that you want to achieve with your physical health goes hand in hand with healing. So you're healing this, and this is a, the symptom is that your body gets healthier. Oh, I like it. Fits my model very nicely. Well, this symptom. is exactly what I was going to ask you. We must we must overlap more often than we've actually mm -hmm. discussed. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'd say. The whole root cause symptom dynamic is exactly the same when it comes to, to health. Most of the time, your 
you have an imbalance somewhere in your authentic self-expression. And we all have, we all, every human has access to every single emotion. And if you say, well, I don't, I don't get angry, like, that's actually a problem. If you say, I don't get sad, that's a problem. Like you should, you, sh you, you have them. And if you don't experience them as emotions, that energy has to go somewhere. And this subconsciously manifests as eating disorders, as maybe binge eating, that's a really good example, fits nicely in your model. As procrastination, that's a really interesting one. Self-sabotage, why is it that you know what you want to do and you can never do it? Because there's a part of you that doesn't actually want to do that and you're not aware of it. And it's picking in at this subconscious level. But then, and I think this is, that's really your realm, you know, addiction, self-sabotage, the food thing. That's really in the subconscious. But I find there's actually a deeper level under this. And this is the somatic expression. And what I find usually happens to, to reach this level, we've normally got this part of ourselves that was starting to express. We kind of pushed it away. We were like, maybe, for example, maybe you got angry about something, but you weren't allowed to be angry around your dad. You'd get angry. I don't like this. So you'd start having a tantrum. Your dad says, like, that's not okay. Or maybe intimidates you. Maybe he threatens you. Maybe something dangerous happens. You're like, can't do that. So you cut it, cut it away. I don't have anger anymore. But it still starts to spill out. Maybe you're being passive aggressive. You know, maybe you're being a bit snide comments. Maybe it's just leaking out. It's coming out of these creases. And you don't, you say, I'm not an angry person. I'm very lovely. I'm delightful. And everyone's like, that's, that guy's really moody. He's a really horrible person. He's really grumpy all the time. All the time. He projects on me all the time, whatever it is. But then if you were doing this, as so you're being passive aggressive, but then that's even received badly, it goes deeper, goes into the body. And now it's expressing physically instead as a symptom, a symptom inside the physical body itself. And at this point, it's really hard to talk with this part because it's scared. It's intimidated. It doesn't feel safe. And I find that talking with these parts at this level has to be done on a somatic level. You can only talk with this part through the sensations in the physical body. And this is where, this is where I've done a lot of work myself. And this is where some of the work I do with my clients now is working on this somatic realm. Because you can have loads of health problems and maybe you've got some of your emotional energy spilling into addictions, coping mechanisms, an eating disorder, procrastination, self-sabotage, it's spilling out all over, but then you've also got symptoms too. And you know something's wrong. And generally what I'm finding with the clients that I work with, they've tried every physical avenue out there that exists and they still have a problem. And you only get to the point where you want to look at this stuff when you've done every single other thing that exists on earth. You've been to every doctor, every specialist, every practitioner, you've tried every supplement, you've tried every diet, and it's just not fixing it. It's not going away. And the problem is, it's not something that needs to be fixed. You're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. You just need to learn how to take care of yourself in a different way. Yeah. So there's this part that is now so traumatized and so fragmented. It's somatized in the body. It's physical. It's gastritis. It's breathing problems. It's that achy joint. For me, it's a shoulder thing that goes on here. I know it's an emotional problem. I'm working on that. But it's an emotional problem. And the only way that you can work at this level is by feeling it in your body. And I've, I think you'll really appreciate this, Edward. This is, this is something that I think you'll really get. When you, get your, when, you, when you bring the conscious mind out of the way and you go all the way down, you go deeper, deeper, deeper. I know all about the hypnotherapy, we've, we've done it. You go all the way down, you get to that place. If you then reconnect with your body, you're kind of bringing the awareness there, that, that, you could even call it like a very shallow awareness because the conscious mind is really out of, out of the situation. You're really in that deep place. And you start looking through the body and just blowing your awareness through. And you'll be like, oh, I've got this pain. Oh, I've got this ache. Oh, I've got this discomfort. Sometimes it's actually different. Sometimes it's tingling. Oh, I've got this numbness. Oh, there's a sparkling thing happening here. Oh, I feel like there's pebbles being dropped. Whatever it is, that is how that part of you feels safe to talk with you. And if you stay with it, you show it actually you can you can talk with me i'll listen to you it's safe and then it starts to come back to you and it comes back into the subconscious it comes back into the conscious and then you actually start to remember these things and you can have oh 
my dad did this, my sister did that, this bad thing happened to me. But you could have had no conscious memory of it whatsoever because it's being held in your body instead. And I know that you'll know this, Edward. Lots of people have trauma and they don't even remember it. They can't even remember most of the history. I can't remember most of my life before 10 years old. I've got like three or four fragments of snippets. I don't remember it, but my body does. It's all there. It's here. It's here. It's in my symptoms. And I know that as I work on this, and I'm working with Edward, and I'm working with X, Y, Z, I'm working with all of the practitioners, and I'm doing this myself. I'm bringing safety to these parts again, and they're, they're coming back to me. And now I can get angry and express it in a healthy way, which looks like I can go on Facebook and say, I'm going to do a live video. And I want to bring Edward, my colleague, who I used to be very afraid of men. And now it's like, cool, I'm doing a live stream with this, with this excellent man, this wonderful man that can help me. We can work together. We can collaborate. Because this part is now integrated. It's whole. And it doesn't have to go through my body. It comes out as confidence, as certainty, as direction, as leadership. It's a part of me again. And that energy that everybody has, we all have a leader. We all have a caregiver. We all have happy or sad we all have a 14 year old rebellious teenager that just doesn't want to do what anybody else says just because they said it that's all inside all of us we've got the three month old baby that can't pick up his own head we have all of these parts inside of us and we need to take care of them and we need to integrate them and we need to use them because they're valuable they're valuable parts of you and if you don't have them you won't feel very good yeah you'll struggle yeah i mean it's fascinating and so just for my own interest sake, we talk about psychosomatic. Yeah. Is that that has a big, that's a big trigger word, you know? If you'd have told me that when I had all of my health problems and all of my physical symptoms and you said it's psychosomatic, it, I would have just said, no, like, go away. It's physical. I feel it in my body. No. That's right. I, yeah. When I use the word psychosomatic, the answer I hear back is, no, no, it's real. Yeah. And so people don't quite often don't, recognize quite how closely linked the, side, the mind and yeah. the body are. They really don't. All um, psychosomatic means is the mind is expressing through the body. Yeah. And it's real. It's physical pain. It hurts. It's a symptom. It's arthritis. It's gastritis. Well, <clears throat> I, think, I think most people would, would identify and recognize the idea of like really stressed, get a headache. So yeah. there are some maybe more acceptable socially acceptable yeah. almost yeah um you know ibs you know big interview coming up can't get off the toilet mm -hmm. that would be quite a common you can't know. digest your anxiety so which means that what i'm talking about there is sort of quite surface level yeah and you're going a lot lot deeper with that yeah so i'd say my my deepest somatization that i, that I feel like i really want to share because it changed my life really did, integrating this, really changed my life, was my own personal power. If, if it's dangerous for you to be an empowered person, you will not be an empowered person. You just won't because it's too, it's too, it's too dangerous. But that energy, think about the, the energy of empowerment is powerful energy. And if you turn that on yourself, you will be very sick. And this usually, you usually see this expressed sort of as a chronic fatigue syndrome is really, really common. You've got one energy that's violently pulling this way and this other energy that's, that's terrified and pulling in fear in the other way. And you're not moving anywhere and you're really tired because you've got this conflict that's happening where you're going in two completely different directions, but you're going 100 miles an hour this way, 100 miles an hour that way. You go nowhere. There's sparks flying, rubber's burning, engines are overheating. You're wasting all of that petrol and you're still. You're not moved anywhere. And you're exhausted, you're depleted, you've got autoimmune conditions, your gut hurts, you've got backache. You're pulling your, you're just ripping yourself apart. Your psyche is all different directions. There's one part of you wants this, one part of you wants that, one part of you wants that, another part of you doesn't want anything. And you're just all over the place. And the way this expresses depends on different, different factors. Yeah, it can be genetics, it can be metaphysical reasons you know like everybody says your liver is connected to anger why does everybody say it well it probably it's probably true and it is it really is your liver processes a lot of your anger your stomach oh what happens when you go on a date you get butterflies in your belly 
That's a som somatized emotion. That's anxiety that you're feeling in your belly. Those little butterflies, that's an emotion. Psychosomatic is, there's a really bad negative charge on that. That's a word that if you, like even, even today, I feel resistance to that word. I would say, no, my condition wasn't psychosomatic. It was somatized emotion. It's the same thing. It's a different word. Yeah. Words carry so much baggage. I, uh, yeah. yeah. Words like we talked hypnosis. about that recently, didn't we? Yeah, we did the yeah, fasting, yeah. hypnosis. Like, there's, there's lots that carry lots of baggage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of the time, it's kind of what you were saying about with, with Jung. It's what the collective conscious or the collective unconscious is projecting on what that term means, not the actual truth of what that word actually is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how it's interpreted is, is more important in many ways, or yeah. at least it's important in the social aspect than yeah. what it actually means. Yeah. And it's really important for you if you're you're having something like this happening, it's important that you can see it. Because as you said, we have to identify where you're at and where you want to go. If you don't know that what you're experiencing is psychosomatic, you're not actually where you are. And it's it, it's so mind-blowing to me that psychosomatic is real. It, psychosomatic does not mean it's not real. It's not I made up. That, it means made yeah. up. To, that's what the sort of yeah. the consensus reality interpretation yeah. You're yeah. making it up. That's what it means. It's in your head, but it's yeah. not. It's real and it's in your body. It's not here. It's here and it is a real thing. And there's actually solutions, which is what is amazing. That's why it's really important that we see this. This is the part of that map, right? Where are we? Where are we going? If we can see where we are and we see this is the truth of the reality of the situation that we're at, we can get somewhere. We can, we can change it. And do you think then that what I do and what you do, there, there are parallels that run on this, that if I'm saying emotionally and psychologically, where are you? Behaviorally, where are you? What is going on? What's wrong? And then tracing back its route to work out the solution. Yeah. Is that what you're doing bodily? Yes. And then it progresses into this. It starts to leak out. I use this idea of the different states of, of, of water. You know, you've got solid, liquid, and gas. Solid, it's frozen, it's stuck in your body. Liquid, it's flowing a little bit, but you're not really aware of it. You can't really see it. The gas is an emotion, that's where it should be. Think about your emotions, where are they? Are they here, are they there? I don't know, but they follow me everywhere I go. So they're here somewhere, we can't see them, but that's how we're supposed to experience them. That's what's healthy. If you can't experience your emotions as a gas, they're either, they're either expressing as a liquid or they're psychosomatically moving into your body and freezing. Yeah. as a symptom and this can be this can be body fat this can happen with weight oh yeah <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely do you find that what do you what do you find is the most common reason that is triggering this process like why why so one of my beliefs is that the body is very intelligent and the symptoms the behaviors everything we have they're always intelligent adaptive responses there's always wisdom there there's always like this deep innate intelligence and if we're trying to find root cause we can always ask the question why is it intelligent for this symptom to be experienced why is it smart for me to have some extra body weight right now and kind of tracing it back and trying to figure out why why do you find people generally tend to carry a bit of extra body weight what is the what's the common reason there is there a, is there a common theme well the, the rate at which i hear i emotionally eat i comfort eat I stress. So there's some awareness yeah. there. Yes. Yeah. And so most, most people are, are reflective enough to know mm -hmm. that. At least by the time they come to talk with you, right? <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. yeah. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, most people who have been on a, a, let's call it a weight loss journey, maybe they've tried lots of diets or they've always had a battle with their um, weight. Generally speaking, um, they recognize that they comfort eat. And let's be clear about this. Comfort eating, stress eating, food is playing the role of a surrogate to something. Mm -hmm. So like what? Well, broadly speaking, love. Oh. Now, some people might call that God. Some people might call it love. Some people might call it comfort. Mm, safety. Satiating the soul. And we're trying to do it by filling the belly. And what we're doing is 
in the same way as that alcohol is the easiest drug to access for escapism from your woes. That's why it's really popular. Mm -hmm. Food and sugar is even more popular because it's even more readily available. Yeah. Try and go in ten, the next 10 rooms that you walk into and, and notice how many different sugar-based options there are. Mm -hmm. Now that's alcohol, carbohydrate, or refined sugar. Everywhere, it's everywhere. And you're only about 30 seconds more, more often than not away, you know, being able to, from being yeah. able to reach sugar, which gives you a rush. Um, and it's like in the same way as a drug addict or any substance that we self-medicate with, but it just happens to be beyond socially acceptable, actually pushed on us. Mm -hmm. It's in foods that don't need any sugar, simply yes. to make them addictive. Yes. Like, and That's so, true. And so we get caught. And so when you look at the eating habits of someone who isn't happy with their weight, isn't happy with their lifestyle, there are <laughs> the common things that is convenience food. I won't mm -hmm. name specific brands, but it's big companies that are available near to your work at lunchtime because you're not prepared with what you're going to eat. So you reach for the thing that's yeah. maybe pastry or it's, you know, a like sandwich or wrap or, yeah, it's fast food. And fast food is way high in sugar and carbs. Mm -hmm. So would you say that in here, there's some level of, I really like the, like de demystifying this idea of like, there is an objective good and bad. Would you say that one way we could do this in this situation would be to look at, in this situation, one of the, the traits of these types of foods that is good, that makes us lean for it is convenience. Yes. We have a need for convenience in these environments, yeah. but we should, if we want to take care of that, we need to plan for it. Well, what areas of life go well when we have, um, what's, the, what's the, we have no ability for delayed gratification. What things go well as a result of being more and more impatient and getting things quicker and quicker and quicker? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. So <laughs> a little bit of preparation, a little bit of work, a little bit of deliberate purpose. These are the things that, that, any journey that's worthwhile incorporates these things. That's profound. I think if if you could sink that in on all of the layers, <laughs> that's all that's all you need. That's it. Shows up. You've got the answer. <laughs> Let go of the past. Yeah. Yeah. Let go of the past. Get prepared. That's it. You're done. <laughs> basically, basically, get accountable. Have a have a goal in mind. Be willing to work. And be willing to delay gratification. No biscuits tonight. Looking sexy for summer. Okay. Yeah, I like and that. I I don't like for me, I I hesitate to, to make adverts and things that are like looking great, feeling sexy, because none of these things, it doesn't matter if you're 17 stone or 10 stone. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What matters is your legs gonna fall off because you have diabetes. What matters yes. is you can't walk play with your grandkids. You are crying at night because you can't control or you can't find the solution to the problem of your poor health in whatever way that manifests. I also work with people that are underweight. It's actually yeah. health management coming at it from an attitudinal point of view. It's all symptoms, right? are just shorter. Yeah, absolutely. It's a symptom of unhappiness. And my job is, and <laughs> I once put on a poster, happiness engineer, and it was dead corny and cheesy, but actually... It's what it I'm is. Helping you. And I'm not, I'm not going to fix you. I can't fix you. You can only fix you. And I, I sort of also joke sometimes. I'm like the shell part at the bottom of the Himalayas. I can go, happiness is over there. It's, it's up there. Like, see, you went no the road, and that road and that one. I can't carry it. I yeah. can't do it for you. But I sure know that, like, I've learned and studied long enough to know and made enough mistakes in life to know. Yeah, that's the most important one, I think. <laughs> it's your own mistakes, right? Absolutely. And I learned... Certainly for me, the life that I want to live through a process of elimina elimination of not that again, not doing that again, that didn't yeah. go well, that didn't go right. And I ran out of things, but I'm like, I guess it's that one then. <laughs> and so it's not about being perfect or stumbling on the perfect routine, the perfect lifestyle. It's being willing to work towards what you value as whether it's longevity or fitness mm -hmm. or aesthetic beauty. Who's anyone else to judge you? You find your own standards of happiness and where you're going to find them. And then we'll put together a plan and we'll get you there. That's what I do. Not yeah. decide for you what 
happy is or attractive is or you know yeah if you want to feel sexy in your body then do it <laughs> you yeah, can <laughs> I, yeah yeah and it's really hard to feel sexy if you're exhausted if you are a doormat to everyone you know if you are a complete people pleaser or yeah you know and you're you feel all over the place because you never know what you're going to eat and and then you eat at night and then you sleep badly and then you're in a bad mood in the morning and then you're running late and life is chaotic and, and shit to be honest with you yeah and all of the things we're talking about like purpose and preparation and a little bit of work and a little bit of delayed gratification is the solve is this is the solution to most of those things and I, i'll tell you a little thing that i I kind of stumbled across quite recently and I love this and it's kind of a little peek behind the curtain. It's something that, that I do that is, I think it beautifully illustrates what I, what we do in, in with the weight loss support, but it, it transcends or it translates to wider life. So I, I like people to, sh to shout and celebrate when they resist temptation. So mm -hmm. I turned down a biscuit at work. I said, no, thank you because I'm trying to achieve something with my weight loss. Mm -hmm. And people think that the celebration is celebrating saying no to a biscuit. But in actual fact, the person that said no to that biscuit hasn't said no to anyone about anything for 35 wow. years. So when they ah. learn to celebrate and be happy about saying no about a biscuit, mm. six months from that time, it's the colleague that always asks too much of them. The friend yeah. that always needs them. them Just flexing that skill on the most basic learning level. Learning and developing a, a skill that is much wider than a biscuit. Yeah. But in actual fact, you've got to start somewhere. And at least yeah. with food, you can choose what to buy. You can choose what to make. You can choose what to put in your mouth or not. Whereas you can't click your fingers and change your colleagues or your sleep. These things don't fix so easily. But all you have to do is don't put the biscuit in your mouth and get up in the morning and get on the scales and they move and you're proud of yourself and you're excited that something that you did made your life better in some way. And that's the foundation of self-worth and self-esteem. And it just goes from there. Yeah, I love that. I think that you kind of get this idea. I, I feel that like this, at least in the communities that I'm in, that you get confident and you build self-worth by like looking in the mirror and telling yourself that you're valuable. It doesn't work like that. You actually have to go out and live your life. Well, maybe it works while you're standing there and then looking at the mirror. But then when you go out and you realize you are overweight and you're really unhappy about it and you haven't done anything about it and you can't say no to anyone and they're force feeding biscuits into your mouth and you don't even really want them. You're not even hungry. You just don't want to say no. It's saying no and practicing and doing it in the real world is where you get the real results. I know this and I'm sure that you experience this as well, Edmund. The work doesn't just happen in the session. You learn tools in the session. You do things in the session. Sure, you can like have breakthroughs. You can release things. It can be really profound. But life's actually happening outside. It's happening out there. That's where you're going to be tested. That's where you need those skills. That's where you need to do it. Yeah. It's not just enough to turn up to the session. You have to do the work outside of the session too. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Um, so I'm just going to ask if anyone listening has any questions just before you, just before you continue, Edward. We're going to wrap this up in... 10, maybe five to 15 minutes somewhere in that range I so i saw a question yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm going hunting for a question okay so if anybody has any questions now is a really good time to ask them we're going to do the questions we're going to talk just a little bit more and then we're going to wrap this up and give you some some juicy conclusions actionable steps what do you do where do you take it from here how do you look good and how do you feel better so if you have questions like, like seriously ask them like we're we're sitting here sweating we're dripping we're delivering we're here trying to help you we're trying to take care of you because we want you to re live really good lives my life is way better than it's ever been i know edward's doing some amazing things over there life can be really good but you have to ask for help when you need it so if you need help and you have questions just try and feel the discomfort of being vulnerable and just do it anyway just ask for help ask the question let us know what we can do to help you to take you to that next step in your process. Yeah. Because that's the whole reason we're doing it. We're not here just chatting along because I mean, I'm having actually quite a fun time, but really right. ultimately I'm really trying to help people. And I think you'd, you'd agree with me. Evan. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And really, I think what we, you and I both had in mind, um, more one second.
<laughs> Can you hear that? No, can't hear no. anything. Good. Sorry, playing back there. Sorry. Can you repeat what you're saying? So I'm saying we really people should really ask their questions. Questions are how yeah. we can actually help people. We can talk about as much as we want, but if this isn't filling in the gaps in your understanding or in your knowledge, it's not really what you need. So we need to know where those gaps are. We need questions oriented specifically to you. You know, give us details. Be be as specific as you want to, so we can help you. And you could direct them towards me or towards Edward or both. Yeah, we can both. Absolutely. Do We'd love Absolutely. to answer your questions. That's why we're that's why we're here. That's why we're doing it. Yeah, that was our hope was um, <laughs> a couple of health agony ants, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely just so we can get you living a better life yeah that's absolutely right um and you know uh it would be lovely if you know some people come across our work and they want to work with us and that's fabulous yeah. um i often say though that like i'm not mercenary with the information that i have it's quite readily available you know look yeah, up the signs of weight, look up the signs of weight loss and save yourself the hassle of getting in touch if that's what you want to do but it's not the information for me it's not the information that gets the results. Yeah. I I have no doubt in my mind. Um, it's the implementation of that. It's, it's the implementation. And that's what the support is for. So we have a question. We have two questions. First question from Joanna. I know where I am stuck in my health, but even with help, sometimes it feels unbearable. Knowing that it is a resistance that I have, knowing that it is a resistance that I have is helpful, but how do I move forward? Let you go for that one first, Edwin. Um, I think that the answer to making changes is not making big changes. Okay. I think that no matter what your pro problem, hate the word, problem is, if you look closely enough, there is something, something that you can always do in the right direction. So it's just find that little thing. It could be a glass of water a day. One glass of water a day is an improvement. And from that, mm -hmm. big oh, things happen. <laughs> this, is, this is a game changer. If you don't have a water bottle, get one. Seriously. It's, it's a great hack. Yeah. Get a water bottle. Um, and so I would say... Where there do, you is, repeat, where there is, do you want me to repeat a part of it for you? Well, what I was going to say was that... <laughs> that there is discomfort in trying to affect change in the direction that you want to find change. If you dial back your expectations and pressure your, on yourself far enough, generally speaking, you will find something. And often I find that someone else talking to you about it really helps. I mean, it doesn't have to be me. But yeah, have, have a sounding board. Uh, yeah, and so... Just as a, as a hypothetical example, if I'm working with someone that has poor self-esteem, people pleaser can't say no, I would say we keep looking through your life at where you always struggle to say no. There and we will find somewhere that on the scale of how uncomfortable it is to say no, that one's slightly easier than the other one. Tolerable, bearable, yeah. just. And in any case, a biscuit, we were just talking about it. A biscuit. A great example. I actually really like that one. Um, and so if you can find it doesn't matter because you probably say that's not worth it while that's not good enough, that's not a big enough improvement. Mm -hmm. And I would say if it's a millimeter of improvement in the right direction, yeah, it's bigger than you think. It's so much bigger than you think. There's some level of humility that needs to be adopted here. It's, oh, absolutely. You have to see that maybe the, the changes you need to make that, that you actually could make are so small that they don't feel worth your effort, but they actually are. Hun I couldn't agree with you more on that. I think people think that they are too good to do some of the lowly things that will help them the most. Yeah. Like, you know, a for job me, in the house. Yeah. For me, it was make my bed. Look, I was thinking that. I don't want to be stealing <laughs> the words of Jordan Peterson. It's Jordan Peterson. Like, it's exactly. That's where I learned it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, no, no, I can't do that. I've got to do bigger things. Yeah. It's, it's, it's accountability and responsibility for something. And we think, unless we're suddenly taking on global warming on a giant scale, that we're not doing anything yeah. worthwhile. But when we, where we put our SHIT together is in the smallest things. It could be 
putting your toothbrush back in the right place rather than laying it on the sink. It, like, it could be any anything. Yeah. There isn't too small a step. And so there is something that you can do to make tomorrow better than today. So start small. That's really it. Yeah. And repeat. Start small and repeat. And it gets and bigger over time as you, get, as you get as you get bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 100%. Cool. So, so next you, question. Big one. I, I, okay. Yeah. I, I guess I'll answer it. I I fully back your answer. I agree. We do need to have humility. Accept the situation that you're in. Take the time. Take a tiny bite. Unless it's a biscuit, then just say no. <laughs> right. <laughs> I agree with that. Let me just read it again. I know where I'm stuck in my health, but even with help, sometimes it feels unbearable. Knowing that there is a resistance that I have is helpful, but how do I move forward? I'm, I'm going to say sometimes life feels unbearable, and that's actually when you're growing a lot. Yeah. If you think about that analogy of burning the dead wood for new growth, burning your part of yourself is painful. You're on fire. It's not always easy. The times that I've grown the most are the times that I've been in the most emotional distress that shouldn't be your whole life you should have pockets of safety of rest of recovery but the fact that you're experiencing things like that that's a good indicator that you are growing that's actually a symptom and it's yeah. a symptom of, of a good thing yeah it's a symptom everyone, of change everyone well not everyone but many people would say sipping pina coladas on a beach from today for the rest of their days would be their dream life now if you did that for your whole life you would never have a skill you would never have any knowledge you would never have lived any experiences. It's in a lot of life's challenges that like satisfaction, as well yeah. as knowledge, as well as skills, as like literally we grow from discomfort. That's yeah. literally how you'd life be bored works. in a week. Yeah. You'd yeah. be sick of pina coladas. You'd be yeah. saying no. You'd be practicing that one. Yeah. And you'd want to be off the beach. You'd be sick of it. Give it two weeks, maybe, if you if you're really yeah. stressed. Well, yeah. you you'd be you'd be bored. I'd be bored after four days and I love the beach. <laughs> if if adversity arrives and you can survive it, there's a lesson to take from it. Mm -hmm. And it's usually very valuable. Cool. I like that. So next question is from Amber. She says, she put this in two comments. So I'll actually read the whole thing. She said, so the question is, what if your inability to lose weight isn't from lack of discipline or poor diet? I fast and do everything right. So it's always obviously been something else wrong that I can't figure out. I think that one's more directed at you, but I'll give it a I'll give it a hack afterwards. But I think you should still go first. Okay. Um, so the the obvious things, um, I would need to know more information, but yeah, um you need to figure out the cause. Not out. enough, not enough water, not enough sodium, so up your salt intake, not enough quality sleep, um, raise cortisol levels from stress, um, portions are bigger than you think, um, hidden sugars and things that you maybe didn't realize had sugar in them. Um, they're some of the main ones. And by all means, Amber, send me a message. And um, between us, we could work it out. It takes exploration. It takes reflection. Mm -hmm. And honestly, what would you say with that? With that being said, what would you say that are the more common, like non-physical things that could be influencing that? So it's not it's not lack of discipline. It's not poor diet. Emotionally, what could be happening that could make you hold weight? It's stress. Stress. Yeah, that's the number one. Stress. So there's a big, big, broad thing. I'm, I'm probably sleep as well. And what I've discovered is that yeah. most people, not most people, more people than you might think sleep really, really badly. And I know someone very closely um, who has fasted for six days in a row and the scales haven't moved. Wow. I've seen stuff like that too. I had a client that was eating one chocolate bar a day. That was a whole diet, gaining weight. What? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, by every other rule, that's ridiculous. Doesn't make logical sense, does it? No, so it can't be it a doesn't. logical problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so to, to do some diagnostics on the person I'm talking about with 60 fasts, they were sleeping an hour a night. Yeah. So the stress during the day must have been heightened. The body couldn't have been functioning well in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, the sleep where sort of HGH go, go, uh, spikes and... All the things that happen, wonderful things that happen when we yeah. sleep, weren't happening. So what you're saying is, the answer to this question is, there's, there, there's, there is a reason. There is a reason. We need to do more investigation. 100%. I fully agree with that. I'd say it is always a symptom. Weight is a symptom. If we've looked at the, the discipline, if we've looked at the diet, it's not that. It's something else. We've checked these boxes off, but there's 25 to 50 more boxes that we have to tick. 
could be sleep, could be hormone imbalances, could be, as you said, like any of those factors that you mentioned, could be trauma. If you if if you don't, one thing that really that I really worked through was I was very very thin because I didn't believe I had a right to exist. And then when I gained that right, I blew up and went the other side. And I was like, I deserve to exist a lot because I haven't existed very much up until this point. And now I need to kind of find that middle ground. And sometimes it's part of your process. I know I'm, actually, I'm carrying a bit more body weight than I like to right now. I, I feel so deeply things will change. And I think maybe this call today has actually been a part of that. You never, you never know where you're going to receive the lessons that you need. Absolutely. So there's a root cause we, that we haven't found yet. We need to find it. Yes, that, that, that's uh, it. Yeah, and there's there's no, and I think probably before we finish up, I should say there's no blame involved in any of this. Yeah, it's just you, it's mapping, right? There's no blame. It's just where are you? Yeah. So there is responsibility, because, and I say that I love this. Maybe yeah. sometimes they get complete that it's my fault. Um, or you're saying it's my fault and it's like oh, no wait a minute a hundred times out of a hundred I would take a situation that is not ideal but within my hands to control it than one that is outside of my hands so um, no matter what my circumstances there is some action that I could take to make my circumstances slightly better if you're a, a child soldier in Africa <laughs> your family's been killed and you're in a gang and they've got machine guns there ain't a lot of options there and life is really bad and it's out of your hands <laughs> But right here, for the majority of us, and yes, we have, there are health reasons, there are family reasons, there are work reasons, there's a million and one reasons that put constraints on our choices in life. But within most of them, for most people in the Western world, there are still choices that lie in our hands. And mm -hmm. while there are those, we may as well maximize our potential. So it's welcome what you've actually got control over and the things that yeah. you don't have control over, there's nothing you can do about them anyway. Yeah. Cool. So just a couple of comments here that I think are really interesting to share is Amber said that she has gained weight from fasting before. That's an experience that she's had. And also Victoria, Victoria chimed in and said when she was in an abusive relationship, she couldn't lose weight. And then when she filed for a, for a divorce, she lost a stone in a month. Just the, just the stress. So really, really interesting. Also, you think abusive relationship, having a little bit of extra weight, that's a bit of padding, you know, abusive emotionally, physically, however it is. That's padding. That's well, protecting you. Well, and you know, if if you've got it in your head that fatter is less attractive, and bad things happen to you when you look at your best, yeah. are you not going to seek to look as unattractive as possible? And I'm not saying that subconsciously attractive. What I'm talking about is if your perception yeah. is I am less attractive because I am bigger. And I don't want things to happen to happen when I'm looking at my best. That is amazing. Well, That's it's a profound. wonderful coping strategy to, yeah. it's not a helpful one, but maybe it is in that situation. But it's working. But it's working. And yeah. so it's incredibly complex. And none of it's in judgment. None of it is, none of it is ever in judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think anyone is in a position to judge anyone. Not really. We've all got our own no, problems going not. on, right? Really if anyone knew the half of what was going on in somebody else's life, they'd probably just <laughs> not say a thing. Yeah. And, but that's because it's life. Yeah, it's life. Yeah. And so, life, yeah, life, and, life well, and the word perfect can't go in the same sentence. They yeah. can't. They can't. Perfection is actually just an idea. It doesn't yeah. actually exist. It's not even real. Yeah. <laughs> so final question. We have Victoria saying, can you please tell me some more about how somatic healing can help someone who has a rare disease? So I think that's a, maybe a bit more targeted at me, I'm guessing. I'm thinking. So I'm, my, my answer to that would be, first of all, it's going to depend on the rare disease. You know, there are some things, sometimes people are just dealt bad hands. If you have a genetic problem, it's a genetic problem. Your, your genes don't change. That's kind of, that kind of sucks. There's probably a lot you can do to manage it. But so for example, hemochromatosis, you've got a bad hand, unfortunately. You can do blood transfusions and you can make sure that you're doing good supplementation to manage it. So there's lifestyle things you can do so you can still live an awesome life. But your genes, they, they don't change. Yeah, <laughs> getting into genetic engineering humans. Don't know where that's going to go, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll be the experiment. But I would say, again, we need to figure out what the root is. Like, what what is the disease? It, does it have? Is it possible? And 
hold hold your triggers here because I'm going to say it. Is it possible there's a psychosomatic group that doesn't mean that it's not real? That doesn't mean that it's in your head. It means that it is real. It is physical. You are experiencing that. Is it possible that it's actually an expression of a certain emotion? Could be. I don't know. I don't have enough detail yet. It's also very possible that, as you're saying, it's it's rare. It's possible that people just don't know what to do with that. Maybe you need to find the right person that can that can help you with that. Could I ask? Could yeah. your DNA could your DNA be structured in a way that uh, psychological or, or, a, or an, ex, an emotional experience could switch on uh, yes. genetic propensity to yes. a genetic disorder? Yeah. So there's some when, when I'm saying genetic, this is kind of like like Down syndrome, right? It's genetic. You cannot. There's literally nothing you can do about it. Hemochromatosis. You can't. You can't really do anything about it. There are certain things that are genetic that you can turn those genes on and off. For example, autoimmune disease, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular risk. All of these are, you can have a genetic predisposition to this being your genetic weakness, but you can change your diet, your lifestyle, the thoughts that you think, the emotions you feel, the people you spend time with, can turn those genes on and off. If you release a trauma, it can change that. You, genetics load the gun, epigenetics pulls the trigger. You can change what's happening. There are some things, so Victoria here says, it goes back generations, it's EDS, Elder Danos Syndrome. This is one of this is actually one of those where, I think it's actually what Edward's saying. I, I think it's more likely a generational trauma. I see this quite a lot. I see people having this and you actually, it's possible to reverse it. Not everybody can. I know there's variances in it. Everybody's different, but there's hope there. There's a possibility. I actually think I have a cool book with Victoria soon, so I'm going to have a chat with Dig into that a little bit deeper. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> um, do you want to dip your tool into autophagy or autophagy? Yeah, we can do it. We can go one step further and we can go to apoptosis as well. So why don't you start us off? I know you know quite quite a, a fair bit about fasting. You start it, I'll finish well, it. Um, from my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. um, when you stop supplying the body with fuel and the building blocks like water and things for certain conditions like water on the knees or like you know arthritis and things like that um it, it takes energy and it takes water for many many health conditions to exist for the continued creation of malformed cells mm -hmm. to maintain certain conditions when you remove the fuel and the building blocks of those conditions they go away and you essentially you can reset your immune system back to the blueprint. Um, and so I certainly discovered this mm -hmm. uh, with five day dry fasts and 10 day and 12 day um, water with mineral fasts. Um, and I think, how, how do you measure it? But I think that uh, also decalcification of my pineal gland <laughs> um, oh. occurred during my longer fasts. Um, and so, yeah, so essentially it takes energy to make cells that are away from the original blueprint of mm -hmm. your DNA. And therefore, like I say, if you cut off the, the fuel supply and the building blocks for those malformed cells, then they can no longer be recreated. Oh. And so fluid comes off the knees, feet, skin conditions, psoriasis, eczema, things like that clear up pretty quickly. Oh, so you're, so you're, the, the point there is if the disease is being perpetuated, because it's this malformation that's, that is sort of automatically in repeat, you can kind of put a little stop sign there, turn that off for a little while, and then when it starts repeating again, it's kind of reset back to that original blueprint. From what I understand. Cool. I, I, I agree. And there's a, so you actually are describing the apoptosis part. You, pro you probably don't know what it is, but you probably know what it is, but you probably don't know that it's called that. So the autophagy is the, it basically means like self-eating. It's where the oh, cells, it? yeah. Yeah. cells start to eat the components that are inside the cells. So they're kind of like digesting themselves. So you've got a cell, it's got loads of different components, just like your body has organs. You've got spleen, small intestine, lungs. Your cells, they've got loads of different things as well. Some of the biggest ones in there being mitochondria, which are the things that make energy for you. So when you go into autophagy, your cells, they start like eating all of those things inside them that are broken and creating new ones that are healthy again. So we can change how this, how this expression is happening. Apoptosis takes this a step further 
where some of these cells that have got like, say that the, 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 the things that are inside that cell, the organs of the cell, they're actually called organelles because they're really, really cute, cute and small, called organelles. If like 49% of the organelles are damaged, the cell, instead of saying like, let's just try and fix this, it just says, I've had enough, it's my time, kills itself recycles all of those resources that go to your liver and it uses them for detoxification for making new cells sho shovels those ingredients into those other cells that are doing the autophagy process and gives them the other ingredients that they might be missing so when you're doing a long-term fast longer than 24 hours you're kicking into this apoptosis which basically means self-suicide basically the cells just killing themselves so, you're triggering that as well so let's not get into a conversation that would get us legally into trouble but there's probably a conversation that we have off camera um or maybe about... in a private group that maybe one of us runs <laughs> hmm, who knows <laughs> um about one of the most problematic big health conditions that the world yeah. is faced with and how these processes could possibly might help, work. Might help. Might is that help. carefully enough said? yeah carefully enough I think so. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we've got, so I said one more question, but we've had another one since then. We've got two more. So uh, you, you rush for time? Got two more questions. No. Can we do it? Good to know. Yeah. Cool. So Nancy says, I think this is a question for me, although you're happy, to, I'm happy for you to answer if you know the answer. Is A2 dairy inflammatory? What percentage organic and grass fed dairy is workable in our daily diet? <clears throat> Over to you. Over to me. Okay. So whether anything is inflammatory depends very much on the individual. So A2 is definitely a less inflammatory form of dairy. The difference being A1 comes from generally a certain breed of cow that has been bred just to produce lots and lots and lots and lots of milk and make lots of money. So you think about the black and white, they're called Holstein cows. They produce a type of milk that's actually more inflammatory in the body. The other cows, so these are generally like Jersey or Guernsey cows, these are like the brown and white ones. They produce less milk, but they produce A2. A2 is called A2 beta casein. It's the, A2 is the short contraction. This is less inflammatory. What percentage of organic and grass-fed dairy is workable in our daily diet? I'm going to say that depends on where you live. If you live in Europe, I'd say it doesn't really matter. Most cows are grass-fed just because it's cheaper to do. If you live in America, you're going to be having dairy that's been fed genetically modified corn, genetically modified soy, sprayed with pesticides. Pesticides are fat soluble. They're gonna be in the milk, you're gonna be getting that. So conventional dairy, not gonna be good. If you're living in Europe, I'd say any A2 is gonna be pretty much okay. And if you're living in the States, it needs to be 100% organic and grass fed. You definitely don't want any conventional if you're living in America. But it also depends on the host, on the individual. For example, I see this a lot, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm not saying this is what's happening, but I'm trying to just open people's minds to the depths of these kinds of things. Some people that have problems with feminine energy or with a mother wound, they're intolerant to dairy because dairy is milk is what you get when you're a baby. So I usually see people split kind of down the middle. They've got dairy or they've got gluten or grains or carbohydrates or fiber. So it's usually dairy, gluten or both. And then you've probably got a lot of, a lot of a big mess there. Welcome to, welcome to my world. That's where I was. Gluten <laughs> and dairy everything so it depends and there can also be other factors as well like certain genetics are, are, are better matched some people they're missing the flora that they need to digest these things like for example your gut flora is what produces the lactase enzyme that you use to break the lactose down so if you're missing that gut flora if you're missing those right those correct healthy bugs when you drink milk you're not going to be able to digest it because you don't have the right machinery. But if you were to take that milk, ferment it, you're going to encourage the growth of bacteria that break that lactose down. Then you eat that. It's going to repopulate the gut with those bacteria. Then you drink the milk and those bacteria are there already and they can do that for you. And now you tolerate it again. So the inflammatory, there's a lot of factors that come into this inflammatory, inflammatory discussion. It's, I don't know exactly where you're at in this stack, but I tried to cover the whole thing. So hopefully that answered your question. If it didn't, just let me know. How was that answer for you, Edward? Did you find that fascinating? Fascinating. Absolutely. <laughs> really cool, isn't it? <laughs> cool. So let's see. Uh, one more question. No, nope, two more questions. We've got two again. We've got one more. <laughs> so Jem. Jem says, emotional trauma and, and such. So activate bad things slash cells in our body, yes, such as cancers. 
Oh, it was me again. Okay. Yep. I will, I'll answer this question. Yep, say <laughs> there are several answers to questions like this. I can give you a really good example of what I see happening most commonly, looking at it through this emotional lens. So there's definitely physical factors. Very often, one, one example you can use is, Think about your kitchen and how your kitchen functions. If you've got just shit everywhere, you can't do anything. You can't make food. You can't do all the things you do in the kitchen. You can't, you can't prep. You can't cook. You can't, there's look, you can't cut your hair. Like lots of people do lots of different things in their kitchen. If there's just mess everywhere, you can't do anything. So the body in its intelligence is like, wow, our kitchen is messy. Let's just take all of this crap and just stick it in this rubbish bin and just leave it over there. Sometimes that's what causes a tumor to form. It's just full of toxins, full of crap. It's full of just stuff that can happen. There's another, and there's, there's other reasons too. That's one, that's probably the most common I see. But on the emotional side, and you'll see that people, people, and it's kind of actually quite sad, several people with cancer kind of wear this badge to their death is that they're the nicest people that anybody knew. They're the nicest person ever. And it's kind of what you were saying earlier, Edward. They don't know how to say no. They people please, they put everybody else first. And there's part of them that needs to say no their anger, their boundaries, they're not allowed to have that. And that part of them has to get put somewhere in their body, has to get manifested somewhere in the body. And sometimes it manifests in that way. It can be different things. It can be a toxic, it could be a trauma. It could be, it depends on the way the trauma works is it depends what we've associated with what. So if, for example, you, you love singing, but every time you used to sing, your dad would come and storm in the room and shout at you, now you'll need to sing, can't be met, and it manifests as a symptom. And that can be anything from something beginning with a C to something else. Could be anything. So very, very, very individual based on genetics, toxin load, microbiome balance, traumas, metaphysics of the situation. But is it possible? Yes, it is possible. It is possible. Final question. And we're really on the final question now. So that's it. If you've been enjoying it up until this point, do let us know because we took a good portion out of our days. We had a big headache with tech support trying to figure this out in the first place, but we were like, we're going to do it even if it's not as good as it could have been. And I think it's been fantastic anyway. So let us know if you've loved it. Final question. Is it possible to get into the healing phase of autophagy if you use pharmaceuticals? I'm guessing that's pharmaceuticals medications. What do you think, Edward? And once again, that's a subject matter that I think that you would be better. Okay. Sure. Equipped. Do you know what? I, the, the, the reason for that is probably you can more articulately dance yeah. around and between yeah. the more controversial Got things. Cool. Yeah, I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> so obviously, pharmaceuticals have to talk with your doctor. If you do want to fast, and you probably can, the only, the only medications that, that sort of in general you have to be careful when you're fasting around the things that affect your, your blood sugars, because obviously your blood sugars are going to be changing a lot when you're on a fast, but always check with your doctor first. You definitely can get into the autophagy phase, regardless of what medication you're on. Even if you're on every medication under the sun, whatever diet you eat, you literally wake up every day and you start as long as assuming that you didn't wake up in the middle of the night. And as, uh, as David said, a bit higher up in the chat, have a salt and vinegar crisp sandwich. As long as you didn't have a snack in the middle of the night, you wake up, you're in ketosis. In a couple of hours from then, you're going to be in autophagy automatically by default. It's just a mechanism that kicks in. It's not so much about cleaning and detox. It's just your body trying to stay alive and it needs proteins. It needs resources. It needs things to function. So it's going to start picking these damaged cells apart. It's going to be killing some of them. When we're looking at doing fasting to increase autophagy and apoptosis, the key word there is increase. These are processes that are happening all of the time. If they weren't, your body would just be full of cells that are still living that shouldn't be. So this is actually a process that happens all the time. We're just boosting it with, with fasting. So whatever you eat, whatever medication you're taking, these processes are already happening inside of your body. It's part of you being able to stay alive. So if you're alive right now, this is happening. It's actually happening like now, 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 now. It's happening every second. It's just less. When you're fasting, when you're fasting, it's like now, 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 now. So it's still happening. You're just doing it more when you're fasting. So with regards to the medication, definitely just check with the doctor and make sure that you, you, you're managing that appropriately. Usually 
most medications is, is fine. Just be careful, like uh, ask, get the help, they're your doctor, they're, they're there for that kind of thing, ask them. But yes, you definitely can get the benefits of, of fasting and many other things, even if you're on, on medication. There's actually a lot of love to be found in medication. I personally didn't really like it and thought medication made me sick, doctors made me sick. That was actually a big wound that I was holding. And I actually love medication now. I don't take it very often, but I had a kidney stone and thank God for morphine. I, I appreciate that medicine is there if we need it and it can really do a lot of good for us. One of the people I support had a husband with kidney stones um, and she happened to mention it in the group that he was in agony. So um, as part of the routine that I recommend, apple cider vinegar comes into it. Three days later, he had a bit of a gurgly and a fuzzy stomach and they were gone mm -hmm. and he'd been for weeks um, in absolute agony. Cool. So apple That's cider vinegar, one. folks. Um, yeah, it's really good. It clears kidney stones. Breaks those stones down. Yeah, definitely. It does. Yeah. But yeah, I had one and I had several compounding health problems at the time. Apple cider vinegar was not an option for me at that, at that point. So it was morphine and surgery and great. It worked. I'm alive. I'm healthier than I've ever been. Haven't had another kidney stone. Fingers crossed, never again. But <laughs> I think I know what I'm doing now, but we'll see. Sometimes things happen. Again, we're all human. We all have problems. Yeah. You, something will happen at some point. So Absolutely. <laughs> cool. Absolutely. So Jen's just finished, got a finishing note here for us. She says, I truly believe without man-made medications, there would be a lot of healthy people. It's true. You have to be careful with how you use medicine. The thing about medicine is, what's the root cause? Is it appropriate? What's the dose? Use it the right way, you can be healthier. Use it the wrong way, you can be sick, you can be dead. Be careful. It's your health. The doctors are, may have your best interests at heart, but you're the one that has to go home with the consequences of the decisions that you make. Yep. Do you have anything to finish up with today, Edward? You enjoyed yourself? Hey, how do people find you, William? Yeah, cool. So obviously this is on Facebook. Just leave me a little comment and say, I need help. And you can say, I need help, Edward. I need help, William. If you need either of us, we'll be quite happy to reach out. We both have a little group. I'm going to talk a little bit about mine. I guess Edward's going to talk a little bit about his. I've got a group called Healing with William. I actually did copy Edward's name. Edward's is Weight Loss with Edward. I copied that, so I'll give him that. I copied that. I was like, I need to do this. It needs to be about healing. How do I get the name? I was like, why, why make it? Why reinvent the wheel? Edward's already done it. So I copied his name. Obviously, I'm not Edward. I'm William. So it's Healing with William. We literally talk about healing health problems. If you have a chronic health problem and you, you just need a little bit of help with figuring out why you've got it, what's the root cause, what changes do you need to implement for it to resolve itself, we can help you do that. And yeah, I run Weight Loss with Edward. Um, we're not a double act thing most of the time. <laughs> um, we could be though, we're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, um, Weight Loss with Edward, basically lose weight if that's what you want to do, feel amazing. Um, we address, well, we've got this sort of nutritional stuff there. So cheat sheets, meal plans, recipes, all the sort of nuts and bolts of weight loss. But we are a wonderful, ever-growing community of around 200 people. Um, getting some amazing results, but we tackle sleep and stress and interpersonal relationships. I work one to one quite a lot with group members, um, so there's a sort of social accountability, kind of helping each other along the way, social aspect, and then there's a behind the scenes kind of therapy work if people want to tackle this or that. We do hypnosis classes via Zoom, and we do meditation classes and meal planning sessions and stuff like that. So everything you could possibly need to lose weight as much as you would like, as quickly as you would like, and have a bloody good time and a good giggle doing it at the same time. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I'm in Edward's group, it's great. Mm -hmm. I work with him, he's a great hypnotherapist. If you need a hypnotherapist for anything, weight loss or otherwise, highly recommend it. Well, thank you, sir. You're most welcome, you deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Been through well, my fair, fair, fair or unfair share of practitioners. You're definitely one of the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, Absolute pleasure. Yep, really good. Everybody let us know. Did you like it? Do you want a part two? Would you like us to make this a more regular thing? Obviously, we've still got 11 people here. So I guess at least 11 people really enjoyed it. Let us know what you thought. Give us your feedback. If we did something like this and we can tackle, we can go into more levels of this. There's, we literally scratched, like we've got the iceberg. We literally scratched, like literally the tip of the yeah. iceberg. There's so much yeah. more that we could talk about with, yeah. with all of this, with weight loss, with 
emotional healing, with self self image, with we can even look at why your body holding onto fat from a needing to detox perspective could be interesting. You know, we have so much to cover. We can talk about, we could literally endlessly just go back and forth about this, covering all of these facets in more detail. So if you liked it and you'd like us to do it again, you come along, let us know and we'll do it. 100%. 100%. Any final words, Edward, just before we finish up? Um, yeah, I'm off to feed my children. <laughs> cool. Feed your children, take good care of your family. I'll do. I'm off to feed myself. Good and my man. wife. <laughs> good man. Right. Cool. Small me a kipper. Yeah. Good, 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 uh, good work, everybody. We'll um, see you soon. Thanks for coming. See ya. Bye. Bye.